it's a Friday edition. No, nope, it's not. Um, it's a Thursday edition here on Zero Block it's a 30. Post long weekend, yeah, edition. post long weekend, post Labor Day edition here on Zero Block 30. And today we have four rounds of the magazine. Round number one the national debt ceiling will actually be reached in October. With the military being the number one eater of all that money, we have some ideas of how we can save the United States from our money grubbing selves. Round number two there's an alcohol ban at the border for the National Guard. So if you're out there doing your thing with the National Guard protecting the border, now you can't even drink. <laughs> it's like that duty assignment has got to be the absolute worst imaginable. Like mm -hmm. the border of Texas and Mexico and most of those spots, there's nothing, like nothing at all for miles. The only thing that there is is signs that say, don't pick up anybody on the side of the road. It could either be an immigrant that's not supposed to be here or it could be somebody that escaped from jail. Those are the only two options. Yeah, and when oh, there's great. boredom like that and nothing going on, people tend to get into a little bit of trouble, which we'll talk about in that round. But Kate, there's lots of rocks out there. So there's plenty of time that you can play rock against pole. Rock Ooh. against pole. Throw nothing better than throwing a rock. I actually, I heard there was discussions that, that that's where they were going to do the national championship of rock against pole. Oh, mm -hmm. that would be good. They, they should, we should have like a military Olympics for like military board game. How yeah. fast can you get a barracks cut? And it's got to be in regs. Like you get time deducted. Same mm -hmm. thing if you're doing like a, a dive. Like you have this difficulty, like if you want to give somebody a medium reg haircut, the difficulty mm -hmm. goes up. But if you mess up spots, you get points deducted. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the possibilities for the games are endless. Can they you really sneak are. someone out of your barracks room on a Monday morning without yeah. being detected? Or sneak that person into the next barracks room because they're just going next door to suck Ooh. another D. <laughs> or, or fellatio another lead. Yeah, there's lots of times that ladies in the barracks just like hook up with male hookers and be like, hey, we're just here. Every it's just a big old lick party. Works both ways. It really wow. does. Round number three, all available boats. This is the United States Coast Guard. That's how the message began on September 11th, 20 years ago, this coming Saturday. From there, there's an unprecedented rescue mission that began in Manhattan. It's one of the more under, I guess, underreported stories of what went on and how the Coast Guard acted unbelievably gallantry uh, with gallantry this during September 11th, during the attacks. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on September 11th here, but we are going to point you to another Barstool podcast, Twisted History. Um, large, one of our guys here, and he's done the 9-11 interview with us the last couple of years. His wife is on and she lost her father and several other family members during the attacks. So we would encourage you to go to Twisted History and listen to that. They recount it like they have it. Large was telling me a little bit about Pod on Podfathers the other day that memories were brought up, notebooks were brought up that they hadn't talked about since it happened because they repressed a lot of those memories and they did it live on the podcast. I'm sure it's going to be incredibly touching. So I would encourage you to go watch that. And finally, round number four, of course, we're going to give you some Afghanistan updates and things going on. Bo Bergdahl was trending on Twitter today, which is oh, never no. a good sign. Anytime Bo Bergdahl is trending, you're like, oh shit, here it comes. There's going yeah. to be some bad news that has taken place. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about in round number four. And we're going to do that all courtesy of BetterHelp. BetterHelp is our main sponsor of the show today, and you need to try it out. I've been using BetterHelp. I actually stopped using my TRICARE appointed one, even though I pay for the insurance and TRICARE covers. I just like the freedom and the flexibility and how much I can schedule online where I don't have to leave. Like my other one, now I that in the place that I used to go, they're no longer accepting virtual appointments. And honestly, over the course of quarantine, I think that's been the biggest game changer for me, mental health wise. I, I'm addicted to the virtual appointment. I don't want to drive because it's it takes so much more time out of my day. Yeah. I can easily schedule an hour, 90 minute therapy appointment. But when I have to drive 30 minutes across town to get someplace, then my hour long appointment is really like a two and a half hour, three hour endeavor out of my day. And that's a lot more difficult with better help. You don't have that problem because everything could be text. It could be talk. It could be video. You can do it basically any way you want to. It's a one stop shop. If you're feeling down and depressed 
it, but you're not at a total loss. You're not alone. There's going to be things that you need to talk about. BetterHelp is customized online therap therapy that offers video, phone, even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. And you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours, which is unheard of, really. I mean, mm -hmm. like to find because so many more people are focusing on mental health. That's great. But because that's happening, so many of the good right. providers aren't accepting new patients. Like you run into that all the time. You're not going to have that with better help. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback. You're pretty much surprised that you're going to gain from it. You're going to be shocked at how much better you feel when you talk to better help because this sponsor is sponsored by better help. And our listeners are going to get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash zero. That's B E T T E R H E L P.com slash zero. Let's get going with the actual show. But before we get into the rounds, there's a couple of things that we need to talk about. One, the big news story of the day. And I guess yesterday too, for those of you who are parents that are around my age, and for those of you who are children um, in 2001, you'll remember Steve from Blue's Clues. Now, mm. Steve from Blue's Clues, if you don't remember, you've seen him before. Everybody in the world, I imagine, has seen him before. He's the, he's the fella that would wear the green striped shirt, one dark color, one light color. Um, and then he had a little dog named Blue, who turned out Blue is a girl. Everybody oh. that was assuming Blue was a boy was wrong because mm -hmm. Blue, the dog, does not believe in gender colors at all. Kind of like me. I love wearing pink. Blue is that same way. Blue is a girl dog. Steve, about 20 years ago, there was all kinds of rumors. I would even say I would even say it goes to the point of hullabaloo. Kate, would you agree with that? There was a lot of hullabaloo, all sorts of rumors getting tossed around as to why heroin heroin that he was a Wait, child what? Molest, that he was a child molester <laughs> all sorts of things which uh, were not true obviously nick jr wouldn't be putting out his video today i mean they might if, uh, no, no i don't think no, they no. would <laughs> they would not no um uh, but yeah Steve, he went definitely and, not a heroin guy definitely not a child porn guy <laughs> he said i just kind of got up and went to college and that was really challenging by the way but great because i got to use my mind and take a step at a time and now i'm literally doing many of the things i wanted to do so he just he up and left blues clues at the height of its fame to go to college yeah. Now, and did, there did was Steve... rumors because he was bald too. Mm -hmm. That one was came up too that Nick actually forced him out because he was bald. That was a big rumor that went out. That too. was another big rumor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did Steve make bank from Blues Clues? I would have to imagine like those child stars that come in there. I mean, bank relative, like maybe not millions and millions, but he probably made, he had to have made good money to be the star of a TV show for that. Right. Long. I'm saying, and I feel like, again, you know, in 2001, I was in high school, so I don't uh, really ever have a need to watch Blue's Clues, but I remember it being big. So I have to imagine he made a considerable amount of money enough that he would walk away from it. Yeah. Or you just get really, really tired of being around constantly doing kid shows. Okay. Yeah. So that said that his net worth, whenever he left the show, was around $10 million. Dude, yeah, that's great. You invest also, that properly, you live real comfortably. Mm -hmm. There was a rumor going around that he had died and was replaced by a lookalike, and it was so much of a rumor in 1998. He went on the Rosie O'Donnell show to be like, "No, that's not true." Oh my god, oh, I'm alive. And that happens with celebrities a lot. With Avril Lavigne, that was yeah. a, a story. Like she had a yeah. body. Who was another one that had a body double? Um, Melania Trump had a double mm -hmm. just for things that she didn't want to go to. Obviously, Kim Jong-un had several, like he has hundreds of body doubles where he could be anywhere in North Korea at any given time. But this story came out and everybody, like he just disappeared off the face of the earth. One day he was on Blue's Clues, the next day he was gone. This, I think this one bothers me because it was in the height of Kelsey's Blue's Clues-ness. Like oh. because there wasn't a whole lot of shows that came on in Okinawa when we lived there. And when Blue's Clues came on, Kelsey loved it. So we went to like the commissary or the AFES or whatever it was and bought the DVDs. Once it was time for the next season to roll around, you see it's coming live on AFN. Steve is gone. No explanation at all given to legions of children who love this mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. fast forward 20 years later, I signed online yesterday. Wouldn't you know it? This green shirt, shirt son of a bitch is back <laughs> online saying, oh, I missed you all along and you were in my heart. Fuck you, Steve. You don't get oh, to go out for a, You don't get to go out oh, for a pack of smokes me? and come back 20 years. <laughs> it's a free country. Steve from Blue's Clues can do whatever no he wants. Steve went out for milk. And miss my next 20 birthdays. Yeah, right. he was the only dad a lot of kids. Hat? Like, where did you get that hat, Steve? 
Yeah. How the hell do you think you are, Steve? This you know what made me? Wash. You know what made me dislike him? Because I was yelling at Chaps about his rudeness to Steve before the show. Mm. He is a musician now too, and he wrote the theme song for Young Sheldon. Ooh. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, that was just a, you know, for those who are unaware, Young Sheldon is the spinoff from that other criminally unfunny show, Big Bang Theory. Can yeah. we say, is it OK to say that the star of Young Sheldon most likely not saying for sure, most likely will be a serial killer? <laughs> yes, Listen, I would say the chances <laughs> are better than not. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Well, look, so, Neil Patrick Harris is weirdo Doogie Howser, and he turned out super cool. That's true. And Macaulay mm-hmm. Culkin's very normal. Yeah. Ish. He no, is. He's not, nor- he's not normal. Oh, well, my he, God. He, he, he's normal now. He went through a phase, Kate. You have to admit, he went through a phase. I liked that phase. 23 year old Kate. He was also the we're meth- the same oh, that was like, didn't that he admit was... to do, being like a meth user? Yeah, yes. that was that was that was right up Kate Sally, 23 year old Kate Sally. That was I, can't, I don't think that we can on this show with good conscience say the meth phase is a good phase to go through. No, no I'm glad not. Okay. we don't we don't advocate for <laughs> we that. We are phase. off the rails. <laughs> we no, don't do a okay. whole lot of shame, and I feel like it's okay to meth shame. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna meth shame. We're we're gonna you know what? Listen, Crack cocaine different. Here we are. The recording on September 8th, 2021, we are going to take a hard stance as a podcast. We do not support meth. That's exactly right. I don't think that's ever been said and it needed to be said. But so if that, you're using, we believe in you. Yeah, we you believe know, in you. You can, you can come back. You can come back and do your thing and get clean and get your teeth cleaned up. It'd be awesome. Second order of business. <laughs> what happened there? I have no idea. Second okay. order of business. Peanut butter and jelly gate because I I described it on Twitter as going on a peanut butter and jelly run. I go on lots of runs, like as far as you do. Go. No, but chaps, it's beyond food. We both do. Your, your life is a series of runs, and it's not just food. It's or it's diarrhea. Food. True. It's it's uh you know working out hobbies it's hobbies. It's you're just a series of runs. Well, that one TikTok described me perfectly, where it's like thanks to hypersubjection. All I can think about is this hobby. All I want to do is this hobby. I've spent <laughs> yeah. too much money thinking about this hobby. Ah, <laughs> time to find a new hobby. Like that's exactly yeah. who I am as a person mm-hmm. where I can't help it. I mm-hmm. get a hobby or get something in my head and it's all I think about constantly. And I have to do it, I have to do it, I have to do it. Well, right now, last night, where two nights ago, we were watching uh we actually started watching Wheel of Fortune on Netflix because Jeopardy's been in a little hiatus, haven't watched Wheel of Fortune in a while. And it was teacher's week. And they said things that you eat at school. And one of the answers was uh, blank and blank. And the answer was peanut butter and jelly. Mm-hmm. And I thought right then and there, oh, shit, I'm about to go on a peanut butter and jelly run because it just sounded so delicious. So I started tweeting about it, giving my ideal peanut butter and jelly sandwich and i'll stop there cons while i'm at saying this what's your ideal peanut butter and jelly sandwich okay this is going to shock some i love and maybe because it got such a bad rap growing up that it was supposed to be quote unquote healthy i like the taste of wheat bread so i'm going wheat bread i'm going chunky peanut butter i know that's another curveball mm-hmm. that people don't like and I'm going strawberry jelly. And that's okay. how we're getting down. And we're not cutting it like sailboats. We're cutting it in halvesies because I am a conservative American who likes to keep it simple. Okay, Kate. Toasted English muffin. Put the peanut butter on it while it's still nice and warm. It starts to get melty and delicious. Strawberry jam. Uh, and there's got to be a good ratio. The spread has to be perfect. You get it in every nook and cranny. And then you, and it's open face. Each is open face. You don't combine what? it into a sandwich. Yeah. So you make the two sides or two open face PB and J sandwiches. That's, that's, that's not a, oh, wait, 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 I'm sorry. Hold on. You put both peanut butter and jelly on both sides. Yes. And I don't oh, okay. stack I, them. I eat them open face. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that's more of like a PB and J crostini almost. Which is very, very fancy, very that delicious. Is, that's, this is the most highbrow thing I think you've done on the, on the podcast is the way that you consume your peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. I got a lot of hate, including from both of you, about how I do my peanut butter and jelly. As you both know, I can cook. However, yeah. when it comes to peanut butter and jelly, I don't care like about it. Like I, one with jelly, I don't like a whole lot of jelly. 
I like sparing mm. jelly and more peanut butter than jelly, but I want the jelly just to show up every now and then. So that's the way that I do it. You guys didn't like the way, and the internet didn't like the way I did it. Said it was the sloppiest peanut butter and jelly they've ever seen. And I disagree. It's not sloppy. It was put on sloppy, but the edges aren't sloppy because unlike Kate, I hate getting sauce on my hands. I think that culinary wise, that might be the biggest difference between Kate and I, where she likes a whole bunch of sauce and doesn't mind it dripping down her fingers and having mayonnaise and horseradish and all that shit. I cannot stand it whenever sauces touch my hands. I just don't like it. My Maybe because only- I'm against, I don't like washing my hands. So I don't feel like I have to. I, I do hate having to wash my hands after I ate a sandwich. So I'm with mm-hmm. you there. My only qualm with your sandwich was how, how messy the jelly looked. And, and I'm okay with your amount mm-hmm. of jelly that you lose because I'm more of a peanut butter guy than a jelly guy as well. If it could have just been a little more e- even and a little more symmetrical, I think you would have had a great no, sandwich. No, that jelly and was garbage. I support your chunky peanut butter choice. Mm-hmm. The jelly was clumpy. It looked like some fake plastic gel. You're clumpy. You didn't spread it. <laughs> even at all. And then the peanut butter, there was more jelly than peanut butter, which is not okay. The peanut butter was spread so thin. Who are you saving your peanut butter for? You're doing well enough. I don't want to be like a dog that has it on the roof of my mouth. Oh my God. And your bread, your yellow ass bread, everything about it. That is a brioche roll. First (laughs) of all, it's a sliced brioche roll. Mm. Yeah, no, it looked just the whole thing made me And potato bread is fantastic and it's yellow. It's always soft. Yeah, potato bread is fantastic. Not with peanut butter and jelly though. It's not for peanut butter and jelly. I disagree. I'm going to have one whenever I, because I am on a run. I had that yesterday for breakfast. And then at about eight o'clock last night, I sat (laughs) down with a nice big old glass of tea had that Ooh. and I, I actually had the original Lay's that I put in the middle of it when I had an, a crunch, an extra layer of crunch. That's the way to do it. That's now, do it. I, we all know I'm a very big proponent of breakfast for dinner. So I think you can eat eggs any meal of the day, but universally is the PB&J the most versatile sandwich in terms of time of day that you can eat it? Yes. I, yeah, I would say so. I mean, mm-hmm. because you can breakfast, I think is the time that you don't see it as much. Lunch and dinner, a quick snack, like a, a in between snack. Like you if can throw an uncrustable at a kid anytime. Mm-hmm. Morning, noon, night for the bus in the morning, whatever. My kid is gonna eat nothing but uncrustables you guys have, until he's like seven. Did you have uncrustables while you're deployed? No, I didn't oh, know what did. uncrustables were mm-hmm. until a few years ago. We had them mm-hmm. in like the big open refrigerator in Fallujah. So before mm. I would go out on missions, I would take it in my little flight suit and I would put three or four Uncrustables on the side and they were frozen when you got them. But by the time oh, yeah. you got to where you're going to be at, they were all thawed out and ready to go. Just perfect. Yep. Mm-hmm. 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 But Much we better. agree, chaps. I think, and I actually all three of us, we all said strawberry, right? Yes. I, my number jam. one overall jelly choice, and I didn't have it because <laughs> I'd go on these jelly runs and then I are peanut butter and jelly runs and then I won't touch it for months at a time. And at least recently cleaned it out. I'm talking about I had papaya jelly from Hawaii. I had pineapple jelly. I had apple. I had peach. I had peach butter, apple butter. I had all kinds. of. Uh, I had some that were from England that were shipped over. And now she just recently threw them all away. I went in there to look for the blackberry jam and she was like, oh, I threw that shit out. Blackberry is a good choice too. I really like Blackberry is my number one overall jelly. Yeah. That's when I'm feeling fancy. But overall, my my go-to is probably strawberry. Mine's KY. Am I right, folks? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Let's get into round number one. I am not having sex these days. (laughs) Mm -mm. Why would you? Mm Oh, no Last time you did, look what happened. Yeah, I'm over it. I'm done. Good point. Never again. Yeah. All right. Well, we're over and done with this this budget because what the Department of the Treasury sent a letter to Nancy Pelosi explaining that the debt ceiling and the um, is going to be completely exhausted by the month of October, which is not going to happen. Like they do this kind of shit all the time. They'll suspend the debt ceiling and then they'll bring it back and say, actually, we need to raise it up. So I actually looked into it and wanted to see what the debt ceiling was because it's, it is an interesting thing. You hear constantly talk about, it's usually when a Democrat is president that the Republicans will talk about the debt ceiling, but whenever they're back in like full authority, they don't care about it. Democrats never talk about it because they're just going to spend money all the time. Like That's just what they I do don't uh, laugh at me so in my imagination a debt ceiling it's the max amount of debt we can possibly be in until the country falls apart is that 
Well, the debt ceiling, so that's what is as, it? as much as like the house or the much as the legislative branch and the executive branch are willing to borrow from other countries because you have to borrow that money from somewhere. And that's the big issue is that because China is becoming a huge superpower, they own a lot of our debt too. Like the, the World Banks and things like that, the Chinese own a lot of our debt. So we don't want to be indebted financially to the Chinese because that could come back and bite you in the butt. Well, right now where we're at, we're almost at the ceiling of what we said would be okay. And these numbers legitimately are staggering. Like if the U.S. government was applying for a security clearance now, they would not get it. No. <laughs> but Can I? You wouldn't get it. I just looked up truthandaccounting.org. It's not left or right. It just tells you the U.S. published national debt versus the actual. Um, they're saying we're 29 like trillions. I, it's, not, it's not a real number. No, but it's fake. the actual one is over 134 trillion. There, I can't count these numbers. One, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 digits long. Yeah, true. Uh, they're saying yeah. each taxpayer's share of this debt is almost a million dollars. Yeah, you're just never going to pay that back. Mm -mm. And we haven't had like been upside the right side of the deficit, <laughs> I think, since the Clinton administrations. There was a couple of years that uh, Barack's did it, I think, for like two years where they had a balanced budget. But other than that, since the Clinton administration, there hasn't been where you're on the right side of the budget. And now it's just absolutely insane. So to give you give you an idea, we're not going to get too much in this into the numbers here. You have all of these um, different budget sites that are saying, this is how much money we need to spend. This is how much money we're bringing in. But you really have a finite amount of money that you can bring into the United States, like that the United States makes on a yearly basis. And right now, currently, we have uh, $6.6 .6 trillion that we are using every single year. $6.6 .6 trillion dollars that that is an astronomical amount of money especially when the revenue that we bring in total is only 3.5 trillion so no matter what at the end of the year you are down what you brought in already so that that would be like us your you owe your entire salary essentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, how do we function? I my my brain just doesn't understand. It. And by the <laughs> way, we've been in debt since 1790 during the Revolutionary War, following the Revolutionary <laughs> War. So we've been so, but, okay, it that that's that's a great point. So if, if you're telling me we've been in debt since 1790, and this is kind of what Chaps was saying when it's fake, if we've been just operating in debt for you know 200 plus years, almost 300 years, what, what's the math on that? I don't know. Um, yeah, 200 plus it really is inconsequential almost because I don't know that we would ever get to a point where we would just stop existing and stop living our lives. Obviously certain things would change in terms of who we would owe money to and who we would be beholden to, but it is almost just all fake numbers. It really is. And most of those numbers, the biggest, the biggest portion of what we use every single year is by far defense. Defense is the biggest one and it's not even close. And if you include the VA into defense, which you probably should, it's mm -hmm. even more insane. Like this year alone, $910 billion of non-defense defense spending, 714 of actual defense and other defense would be 988 billion as well. So you'll have almost, I don't know what that meant, like almost three trillion, two trillion dollars in just defense stuff that you owe every single year because all of the retirements, all of the VA benefits, all of those things, it's just insane. We're not going to solve it today. That's not going to be our intention. And if you're listening, you're like, holy shit, I am not listening to a numbers podcast. One thing I can promise you, as long as Kate and I are on a podcast together, it's never going to be numbers based. Ever. I don't believe it. Cons can do it. He's got a big boy job where he does numbers and shit like that. Mm -hmm. Kate and I will never participate. In mm -hmm. that. So if it's a solo pod, feel free to skip it because it's just going to be cons giving out a PowerPoint. So we yeah, have... <laughs> even I don't want to sit through that. Nobody wants that. But we do have some ideas about how we can fix Department of Defense spending because there's so many different things that you see, like even as a junior service member, like that's a huge waste of money. That's a huge waste of money. Well, Why are we doing that? Remember, we had a story on here maybe about a year ago where this like $500,000 submarine part, some like E2 was like, yeah. well, I, well, I can fix it with this piece from my Atari video game for $10. No, it was, was $37,000 that the yeah. government was paying to steer certain part the telescope on submarines mm -hmm. and an Xbox controller worked. 
like, yeah, the, like, like they just brought in their Xbox controller, hooked it up, and it was just like, got it. <laughs> we can and do again, that. you've lamented this time and time again. A lot of times the the politics and the promotions within the military, it's how much money are you in charge of? And if your unit isn't spending its full allotment, you get less the following year. So it actually is it's you're incentivized to waste fucking money in the military. True. And there yeah. is a happy balance, too, because if you if you incentivize not using your budget, there would be Marine units with motherfuckers walking around butt ass naked and <laughs> yeah, having true. absolutely nothing. There yeah. has to be some sort of common sense middle ground. But the way that we do it right now is legitimately crazy. And mm-hmm. we hear stories constantly. And I, I would say that I'm not smart enough to really like report on it about the way that Congress works, like where you have we had. A congressman, for example, go gets out of the military as a colonel, goes and works for a defense budget, puts all of his money into a stock with all of those different defense funds. Next thing you know, he makes $25 million, and then he encourages us to stay in Afghanistan for longer. Like, to me, it's like, what are we doing here? It's a never-ending cycle. The, I, you hear industrial complex a lot. The military-industrial complex is a real legit thing. Yeah, but the problem with that, what you just said, Chaps, the people who would be responsible for correcting that course of action are the ones that are directly benefiting from it. So they're legitimately the hot dog scene from I think you should leave. Like we're trying to find out who did this. Who did this? Who who kept this war going for 20 years? (laughs) But I mean, like, you know what? Let's just be very honest with each other. Chaps, if if every year you were getting a check for $10 million and you didn't have to do anything, but if you realized where that $10 million was coming from, would you necessarily speak up? Not everybody's going to say yes. No, I'm a, I mean, depending on what the what is behind it, like if you're right. talking about deaths and shit like that, I would hope so. I would hope I had that integrity. But there mm, is a lot, certain, of, a lot of people don't. They're, they're, I mean, we see it like in yeah. our government, yeah, the no way shit. that things operate. Like, we just see it constantly, but not on like a serious note, because obviously you can do taking away different bases. You have too many bases. You have too many things that are going on overseas. But real legit, I oftentimes wondered why is the administrative staff the way that it is military and not civilian, where you could have legit people who are in place permanently that have full-time jobs that can get pensions and things like that, that it's their sole responsibility is this job to do admin in this place. Instead of bringing in 18, 19 year olds fresh out of MOS school that are having to do this. And then they grow up and they make a lot more money. Like in the benefits package that you have to pay a military member comparatively to other folks is so much smaller. Mm -hmm. You know who we need doing the military budget? Ooh, ooh. All the moms from TLC's coupon wars or whatever. Oh, I thought oh. you were gonna say Mary Kondo. Um, her too. <laughs> Clean. She can organize. Oh, what if she went over? She. We should have just brought wow. her to Afghanistan and be like, yeah. "Can you spark, spark joy? joy? <laughs> spark joy in Afghanistan. <laughs> Help us get all this equipment home in an orderly fashion." Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> so yeah. So we we took to our social media accounts. To, well, first before that, Kate, do you have any ideas of how to fix the budget? What would you do if you could okay. take stuff away? One of the first things I thought of was uniforms. I feel like we've every we report on this a few times a year. The army is changing their their camouflage. The so and so is changing this, changing that. The Marines are adding this to a dressing for all that shit is so expensive. It is so wildly expensive. And And the research and development that goes into it is expensive as fuck, too. uh It's expensive as fuck, too. I mean, obviously, if you can find a better fireproofing or whatever, update the uniforms. But if it's just for aesthetics, like those crazy navy blue wackadoo, whatever. um, (laughs) No, the navy camis. Those navy camis were atrocious. Atrocious, The blue blue digital. (laughs) Remember the the rumor was they turned like a hunter neon orange if you fell into the ocean or something. (laughs) That's I believed it. I was like, I have a question. And and. And, and this is going to be a, a hard one for you. I believe to any answer. rumor about the Navy period. Yeah, yeah. true. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this will be a hard one for you to answer because the, the Marine Corps does have some very sharp uniforms. What if across all of our military, everybody wore the same uniforms, 
and you had maybe like, you know, a little patch or a pin or a ribbon or something to designate which branch, but we just all had the same uniforms across the entire military. We should have a draft. I think like if you bring the, the joint chiefs together and say, look, we got five different uniforms right now. Cause we'll include the coast guard space force or wh- however many branches we got six. Mm-hmm. Like, so we have all those, the top six folks that are in there and be like, look, we're going to draw sticks. The first, the short stick, you get to pick the dress uniforms and then yep. whatever it is, that's the one that we go with. Hopefully it'll be dress blues. Secondly, I don't think Air Force and Navy are going to get a single uniform in there. No, they like, definitely no, don't. No, nobody's going to want. It will be a combination of Army and Marines uniforms. Yes, I would take yeah. our dress blues, your pink and greens. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't mind yeah. that as a, your service uniform is better than ours. Yeah, definitely. And Here's then we can all have thing, the same though. camo pattern. Mm-hmm. There's also no need, like in the Marine Corps, there's like eight different uniforms. Ch- pick three. Fucking pick three. Pick the one you're wearing out in the field Dress, and you work every day. Short sleeve service, camis. That's it. No more. No extra wackadoo. I never wore my woolly pulley. I never the wore pulley out of here. That XYZ. thing's itchy as shit. Like maybe only issue that to people you know for sure will be wearing it instead of issuing everyone in the core the same shit. What about you know the inspector that. gadget jacket? We keeping that? Never ever fucking wore it. Never dude. wore it's it, insane. but it's fun to goof about. Yeah, see, and it's just you're true. That's true. That's true. If I ever <laughs> did want to flash, that's such a good flasher jacket. There was a gunny senior drill instructor, gunnery sergeant Love was his name. That was in my that mm-hmm. was the deck below me in boot camp. And he was amazing at singing cadence to different songs. He would do it to like Bob Marley. He did it to TLC's waterfall. And then whenever his recruits were marching in their all weather coats he would do and everybody was just like mother of god that is beautiful gadget that's what you need that jacket for we'll keep that one too my other thought okay go ahead kate bake sale yeah Uh maybe if every unit had a bake sale we wouldn't be in this mess that's a good point there's an idea from the social um accounts that you're going to love that has to deal with making money. And I think it's going to be fantastic. Cons, what about you? You're, you're, you're changing the military budget. You're going to save us a lot of money. What are you going to do? You kind of briefly went over this one. I combined posts for multiple branches too. I think we have a lot of extra room and a lot of posts that just not use. Lots of joint service bases, joint base service, San Diego would make sense. Yeah. More, more joint service bases and, and get rid of any superfluous bases. Uh, you know how, like when you look at your credit card each month and you try to identify recurring payments, that stuff you're paying for, and you don't even realize, I mm. guarantee there's stuff we're paying for that nobody even realizes we're <laughs> oh, still without paying for. question there is. So we got to get like true bill on that and just be like, Hey, what's the DOD just spending millions of dollars on that? We don't even use. And then finally, here's the deal on new weapons or any special projects or everything. Every branch, you only get one to work on at a time. And you all have to pull from one budget. So there's like a hundred million. You got to divvy it up and fight over who gets that hundred million and why. And you got to present to a board on why your idea is needed for our military. But that's it. I don't need four different planes in development by the Navy. Okay. We've already seen what's been going on with the F-35 from the Air Force. That's clearly a mistake. And write the contracts with the Lemon Law. Like, why should we have to pay this much money for an F-35 that doesn't work? Bingo. Like yeah. what? If it doesn't work 60%, 70% of the time, then you have to get, you have to return the money back to us. Mm-hmm. Make mm-hmm. it better. And yeah. my, one of my big one, we have way too many nuclear weapons. We have over 600 or 6,800 nuclear warheads. The amount mm-hmm. of people that is required to protect those and the infrastructure to protect those is insane. How many do you need? You could blow up the entire universe several times with 6,800 nuclear warheads. That's absurd. Same with the military uniforms. Pick one really big honker, pick a real tiny cute one, a little suitcase nugget. And then pick a good rocket or something. You know, something. it really should be like the food pyramid. We got like right. some nuclear bombs up here. You go down the food pyramid, you got some Moabs, and then you got some other shit. Right. You got your tomahawks or whatever. And then you have, it just gets smaller and smaller. Have more of the you smaller know ones. You don't so- need a whole bunch of the big boys. When are you going to drop that thing? Exactly. You know what's so asinine about nuclear weapons? If we ever get to the point where we're using nuclear weapons, you're going to get to use like one, maybe two. You're not going to get to 6,800 because we're all yeah. going to be toast. By that time. So it doesn't even matter. Another idea. We strap a nuclear weapon to a space shuttle Mm -hmm. and we charge people and you can only do it in theaters. You charge people 150, 150 bucks. They have to go to a theater. It's going to be live streamed of a nuclear weapon trying to blow up one of Jupiter's moons. I'm in. 
I I would genuinely watch the shit out of Absolutely. it. Absolutely, it would be incredible. I don't think anything would happen here. I don't know what the nuclear blowback would be, but you got to think it'd be worth it. That like if, if, if think global too. warming gets bad enough, just start blowing stuff up. Just let's for just fun. get creative. Yeah, a good something that bring the whole world together because everybody loves the moon. The moon's beautiful. A good old they, nobody would know it was the U.S., but an evil plan to blow up the moon. And then people have to pay unless our GoFundMe reaches this amount. We're going to fucking blow it to smithereens, motherfuckers. Guess what? It's us. We're trying to erase our debt. Mm -hmm. Or if Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos got together and they did one of those holiday light shows where you would do like the LMFAO where it's like party rocking in the house tonight and you have the Christmas lights going. Put yeah. that motherfucker on the moon big enough where everybody on Earth can watch it. So then yeah. everybody's outside just like party rocking in the house. How does that make us money? Tonight? It wouldn't, but it'd just be fun it for would morale. Be great. It'd be like it a would. mandatory fun day. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd be doing, I would love that shit. But we also took to the social media channels because there are actually some pretty decent ideas of what we could do to mm -hmm. uh, eliminate money. JT Jag said that create dedicated factories owned by the U.S. government to machine specialized parts in-house and cut out the outside contractors who charge a thousand uh, percent markup. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, speak, that's a good point. There was contractors in Afghanistan, civilians that did the same jobs as us. And in the smoke pit would be like, all right, how much are you making for this? You're doing my exact same job. They were making like $200,000 a year and I'm making yeah, like 40000 a year. And I'm like, what the fuck? We're spending so much money on contracting. Like, mm -hmm. why can't, why don't and, we just fucking do it? And in the United States too, like we need to get rid of the congressional law that says that you have to buy things from only government contractors. You could, the cleaning supplies, like I go back to this one when I was a company gunny. I, I can had, smell like, it already. Lysol was like $8 a thing when you can go to Costco and buy it in bulk for nothing. Mm -hmm. I got right. in trouble for that shit because I went to Costco or went to like Wegmans or something like that, bought a bunch of cleaning supplies. <laughs> Lugo was like, hey, Gunny, where the fuck you get all these cleaning supplies? You didn't get this from base, did you? And I was like, no, first iron, I didn't. That's fucking illegal, dog. You go to jail for this shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's right. They need to get rid of that. If you could save your saving money should be one of the things that you're like, this is what it was last year. This is how I did it and maintain proficiency. That should be the line. You have to be able to cut the budget while maintaining proficiency. I like it. Mm -hmm. I like Next it. Next up, we have got? tanks. Tanks first. I get, I check out the Navy and Air Force planes operating costs. I've heard for years that some of the planes are far more than cost efficient. That's actually true. They have started, the Marine Corps got rid of all their tanks and a lot mm -hmm. of those, uh, Tankers went over to the army, actually, and they're they're chilling over oh. there. So that's some consolidation there to save money. Dan Rankley said ensign. Just get rid of all of them. I agree with that. And we'll <laughs> we'll attach that to not just ensigns, but second lieutenants across the board. Kyle and I, our old producer, we were talking about this. Except for the military schools, I wouldn't mind seeing them get rid of ROTC and the officers training program completely and pull pull NCOs, pull corporals or above. You have to be a corporal. You have to be in for two years. Pull your officers from the enlisted ranks and then let them go to OCS. Where you don't have to, college shouldn't be a requirement or anything like that. Do you perform? Do you have the ability to lead? Now you can go be an officer. I don't hate that, uh, eliminating ROTC, because the other problem with the ROTC program is it really is very varied school to school. So if you get a, a squared away ROTC commander, your O2C program is going to be really good versus if you're at some other university and your commander kind of stinks. So the, the level of officer. And you don't even have to be an ROTC to go be an officer somewhere else. I you could just be goofing. feel yeah. kind of better though, having some of them run through the old college mill, you know, I don't, I don't know if I want every <laughs> officer just rolling up from. Enlisted. Well, it depends. Well, God if you're going to do them. that, I think it should be, it should be attached to your job. Like what does yeah. having a degree in art history really do if you're an artilleryman? Not a whole yeah. lot. Yeah, I guess yeah. if you can get through artillery officer school, that that really is the, the stuff you need to know. This yeah. one is super simple from uh, from Sucker for a Parlay. So he must be on the Barstool Sports book. He says paper, just in general. Yeah. Just get rid of paper. I actually think that's a great idea. The amount of money that we spend on paper has to be astronomical. And because along with that, printers and, and ink for printers. So and antiquated. just let, let official paper work go through that doesn't have to be absolutely perfect like you know i can't tell you how many times where you would have 
letters of intent or training manuals that you had to print over and over and over again because somebody wanted to correct it. Correct it on Microsoft Word, send it back and make your corrections there. The amount of money that we waste on printers, which first of all, hardly ever work, is crazy. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I love this one from the Ball Hogs at Ball Hogs show. Sell ad space on the uniform. That's the Hell one I was yeah. telling you about. I like <laughs> this, that one. This uniform is brought to you by Rip It's motherfuckers. <laughs> Hell yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, and different ranks. You get different types where you they'll provide your shit too. Like imagine Rocky Boots. Uh, today's uniform is brought to you by Rocky Boots. And Rocky Boots has, they supply the boots for all the E3s and below in the Marine Corps. That's the one that you're going to do. Then when you get super fancy, you can go get a Danner or something like that. That's the way that it should be. You do an ad. You do an ad for that brand on your Instagram in your uniform. You get 30% off with your next uniform thing allowance when you go to buy another pair, you know, Mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I like this one from our friend, Matt Martin, Navy subpar football team. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This one, I kind of agree with it, but they sort of do it already. Everyone that hasn't passed the PT test in the last three years get retired automatically. Yeah. They already kind of do that. Yeah, they, they do. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll, they'll push mm-hmm. it out if you're a fat body. Can't be fat. Sorry. Oh, someone said the ba- disgruntled boats said disgruntled boats said the band. No, no. I like the band. No, I kind of agree with them on this one. Like, why is the band that? Why do you have that many bands? Like every base needs a band. Not Just every push base. play. Who cares? Like if you're at if you're at a Marine Corps ball and there, do you really care if somebody's there on the trumpet? playing the Marine Corps hymn as opposed to just the tape? Man, it's like when you see live music versus listening in your car. It definitely just slaps different, okay? It so means I'm a not... lot to old people. Right, exactly. Mm. You it means keep a the lot old to olds. Happy. Right, they yeah. did a lot for this country. I'm I like... saying keep the bands. Brett, Brett, Tavidapapa. Anyway, exactly he right. said <laughs> foreign bases that are overstaffed uh, Close unnecessary bases. The U.S. has over 800 military bases in 70 countries. I'm not fact checking that, but I wouldn't be shocked if it's true. <laughs> Why? They can't all be strategic. I love the thought of some like low lying Caribbean base where everybody's straight chilling, like shut the fuck up, Brett. We're having a pretty good time down here, bro. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, man. like so, leaving doing... Guam. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, ever, you guys uh, ever see that movie with uh, Tom Arnold, McHale's Navy? Mm hmm. Yeah, that's basically the same thing. He's, he's got a great setup. He's like, yo, Brett, sh- shut up, man. <laughs> and finally, I think this is one that we can all agree on. In the stupid thing that you have to get new furniture every year or every other year, the amount of money that is just wasted on that because then you won't be able to get it next time. Do you really need a new conference table? Because those conference tables can be huge, sit like 40, 50 people. That's got to be a $10,000 table. At least. At, at least. At least. Because they're, they're not like rickety tables either. They're very sturdy tables. So that's quality furniture. And the absolute last one, just get rid of Russia. And that would solve a lot yeah. of our problems. I oh, love absolute. Yeah, we could get rid of some. No, I'm not going to say we should nuclear bomb. Mm. No, <laughs> we, we, say, remember, we, we don't we advocate that fact. That. Yeah, we're not. We don't like to do that. All right, let's go on to round number two today, which is going to be down at the old southern border where things are still happening. Sometimes it's easy to forget. With all the other news that's coming out of Afghanistan and all the other places that, hey, guys, we actually still have a bunch of troops that are that are down there that are just doing their job, doing what the country is asking them to do down there. Um, And this round is going to be brought to you by our friends at the National Highway Safety Administration. It can be a little frustrating, especially if you're hurry or running late and you're crossing a railway waiting for a train. And if the signals are going down. And the train's not even there yet. You may feel a little bit tempted to try to sneak, sneak, sneak across those tracks. Well, don't ever. To the naked eye, trains often appear to be further away and moving slower than they are. They can't stop quickly. And even if the engineer slams the brakes right away, it can take a train over a mile to stop. By that time, by that time, it's too late. And the result is potentially a deadly crash. The point is. You don't know how quickly the train can arrive. The train can't stop quickly. Even if it sees you, it can end in a disaster. Even if the signals are on, the train's on their way, and you just need to remember one thing. Trains can't fucking stop. If you want more information, go to the trafficsafetymarketing.gov slash get materials slash drunk driving slash national mobilization slash peak enforcement slash kit. Yeah, I live across from a train station and it's a a major railroad crossing. And I watched a mom with two kids who could barely walk go. She like went underneath the thing as it went down 
and her kids were taking their sweet time and she's trying to drag them across four railway tracks and the train was coming. It's like, what lady, what the fuck? Like, and you could see in her face, like, oh, the train's coming faster than, and all the time my train's delayed because people's cars, they, they do that. And it fucks up my commute. So yeah, listen to the, listen to them because it fucks up my commute. Anyway. Exactly right. All right. Let's yeah. move on to round oh, number two. I've been holding Kate. that in. <laughs> Kate, what do we got? Okay, sort of a pretty sad story here from the border. A Georgia National Guard soldier assigned to the guard mission at the southwest border was arrested and charged with manslaughter on Sunday morning. Within hours, a ban on alcohol consumption and a new curfew for guardsmen on the Title 10 border mission was instated. Specialist Bianca Farmer was driving a GSA rental vehicle with two other soldiers when she lost control and struck a pair of light poles. First responders arrived on the scene and pronounced specialist Nashira Whitaker deceased. According to jail records available online, the McAllen Police Department arrested the driver, Farmer, and charged her with intoxicated manslaughter with the vehicle, driving while intoxicated and intoxicated assault with a vehicle. The soldiers were all assigned to Joint Task Force North, which is more than 3,000 troops uh, from the Guard protecting or providing detection and monitoring logistics and transportation support to Customs and Border Protection along the U.S.-Mexico border. The crash was only the most recent in a string of service member deaths among the Guard troops assigned to JTF North. Last month, an Alabama National Guard soldier died of COVID while isolating in his hotel room two weeks after a positive test. In July, a Louisiana National Guard soldier assigned with the same company as Whitaker uh, died when multiple civilian vehicles struck him crossing McAllen Street at 3.30 in the morning. Sources say he the, the soldier was intoxicated. Within hours of the accident, uh, this most recent accident, the commander of the Guard issued a new policy banning possession and consumption of alcohol for all guard troops on the title 10 border mission. Also 10 PM to 5 AM. You better be in your fucking barracks. There's a curfew now, um, unless you're working the night shift. So by 10 PM, that's it. 10 PM to 5 AM. He also ordered that all service members will not consume or possess any alcohol, uh, along with stricter vehicle accountability measures. There have been other alcohol related incidents, including ones involving sexual assault and harassment, um, and a Marine National Guard, a Maine National Guard soldier was charged with kidnapping and a bunch of other horrible stuff in December. So it sounds like a shit show down there. Yeah, Every now and then. I mean, that's the decision you got to make. I mean, that's yeah. the one you got to make. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, the two worst things you can give soldiers or any military member are, are time to themselves and alcohol. Yeah, you, you combine those two and more often than not, bad things are going to happen. So I absolutely support these these drastic draconian measures to, to just say all right fine no more alcohol because I, chaps you can speak to it more but it seems like there's probably not much going on down there not much to do to pass the time so people are just getting drunk and being stupid and that's the that's the hardest or one of the hardest things as a leader you know knowing that when you are letting your soldiers go and they're no longer under your direct supervision that they're just going to act properly and again when you have kids who are 18 to 22 it's they're gonna act for, like they're 18 to 22 for a lot of them this is college for them for the first time it's right. their first time away from home their first time with a paycheck their first time kind of being free and like mm -hmm. they're they're human beings too just like college students they're gonna do a lot of dumb shit and it's on a mission that sucks like i think that's a big right. part of it too like there there is a huge difference in being somewhere deployed or forward deployed and where you believe in the mission. And we see that all the time in like the, the later stages of Iraq, the later stages of Afghanistan. Once you start not believing in the mission and while you're there, your guard drops a ton. You're like, this mm -hmm. is just fucking bullshit. And that old thing, like complacency kills, like that, not just in a combat zone, it's everywhere. Like where you just stop doing the basic things of discipline and next thing you know, tragedy happens. And I don't think that a lot of times these bans work. And I think that it can harbor some sort of resentment towards the commanding officers as well. But that's that's the role you play as a commanding officer. Yeah. You don't give a fuck. If you want everybody to be mad, be mad, but you're showing up to work tomorrow. You're not dead. Right. Be mad at me. Yeah. I don't care. Be mad at me all you want. I, I don't want another incident to, to ha occur on my watch. Mm -hmm. I would say like, I think this goes for any unit. The biggest dramas and incidents that we ever had repeatedly were always somehow revolved around alcohol on the weekends or alcohol in the barracks on like a Thursday night or whatever, like almost always the biggest problem circled back to alcohol. But then you're right. There's a fine line between, and we would get it banned for like a month. We wouldn't be allowed to drink in the barracks or we wouldn't be allowed to do this or that one. 
Troops always find a way around. It. Always find a way around it. We would then, if we couldn't drink in the barracks, we'd go to the bowling alley. If we couldn't drink at the bowling, then we'd go like behind this building and the whatever, blah, blah, in blah. In Okinawa, they, they didn't sell Marines any more than a six pack. <laughs> like if you're on the yeah. Air Force base, like you weren't allowed still, any more six pack. They'd still find a way. But too, and there's, so there's a fine line between banning it and knowing like, and keeping morale up too. It's like, mm. a, uh, that's why I was listed in that commander. You guys sort it out up there, cunts. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they're going to do. Hopefully that gets cleared up and they don't have to stay down there too much longer. I know the border situation is bad. Like there's a lot of things that are going on at the border with uh, lots of people trying to come over and do it all. Being in the military and not having like the federal authorization of any type of law enforcement, it's an impossible situation that these that these troops are put into. Impossible. Mm-hmm. The fuck yeah. can they possibly do? The only thing you can do is stuff that's going to cause you to get negative, bad news. Anything that you do positive is not going to come out. Right. And that's yeah. rough. That's really a rough is. feeling to be in. Very lose lose situation. Yep. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to round number three. And this is where we're going to talk a lot about September 11th and some of the actions. But I, I, I wanted to, before we go, this September 11th is obviously a turning point in America. And I was reading an article today that there was no bigger call to arms for the military than September 11th since Pearl Harbor. There was 8% increase of people who were trying to get into the military right after September 11th because people wanted to defend the homeland. We've done countless interviews, and I would say of people that are around our age, Mm -hmm. 90% say September 11th was the reason why they joined and the reason why they felt a call to some type of duty, whether it be no matter what branch of service, they felt that call because of September 11th. So I don't know if we've talked about this, but Kanz, I wanted to ask you when September 11th happened, where, where were you? Because it's definitely one of those moments and just kind of want to go back in a personal way. Where were you when September 11th happened? Second period history class, Miss Storapan, senior year of high school. And the announcement came over the loudspeaker about the first plane and then milling about, went to my next class, the television was on. And in my next class, third period religion with Mrs. Farrell, saw the second plane hit. And that's when we knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. And then eventually, maybe 20, 30 minutes after that, we were all brought down to the auditorium and explained in a little bit more detail what was going on and, and told us all to, to go home for the day. I remember a lot of my friends in the parking lots crying because of where I grew up. A lot of people's parents worked in the city and mm-hmm. some even in those buildings that, that day. And I can remember driving to a, a part in my town where we could see what was going on, albeit from a distance. And it was just hazy the rest of the day, not knowing what was going to happen. I remember football practice obviously was canceled that day and not knowing how we were going to proceed in the, the coming days and in the, in the coming weeks, just that uncertainty, because obviously nothing like this had ever happened before. And I can distinctly remember thinking, okay, so the planes hit both of these buildings and I guess they'll shut them down for a little while and they'll do the construction and they'll, they'll fix them. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that they were both going to fall down. I, mm-hmm. I distinctly remember having that feeling that I did not imagine that they would fall down. And then when they did, it didn't feel real. It almost, it was like, uh, kind of like you were watching a movie. You're like, wait, that uh, planes aren't supposed to fly into buildings and buildings aren't supposed to fall down like that. What the hell is going on? And it was just, as I said, a, a very big haze that whole day. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, jumping off what Khan said to this area, the New York city suburbs, whether it's Jersey, Connecticut, like anywhere within two hours, you go to any small town and there will be a memorial there with names. Every town for like a hundred miles around here lost at least someone mm. from, because it was such a huge commuter city. Um, and lastly, you live in this area long enough and you start to make friends. Even 20 years later, you meet somebody last Labor Day as a party and two of the people I was talking to had each lost a parent in the attacks. And it's like, man, this many years later, like it is just constant reminders still 20 years later of what was lost here. It's just kind of always around um, as it should be Um, me. I was my high school. You could volunteer at the Veterans Hospital at the our high school is at the bottom of the hill and the Coatesville VA was at the top of the hill, this big, beautiful building that overlooked ours. And second period, this big blue bus would come down and you could volunteer this. You got credits for this to go up and hang out with the veterans up there. So Mm -hmm. I was like, hell yeah, count me in. I was actually up in the and I would play like chess and checkers and whatever with these World War II veterans. I was actually up there at the VA and they 
put it on the TVs. And I, I was sitting with like World War II, Korean, Vietnam veterans. Wow. As this guy, it was the nursing home area that I, that I volunteered in. And I was sitting with them when this unfolded and the room was just completely, completely silent. And yeah, took the bus. Back. And I kind of don't remember the rest of the day. I, I think I still had field hockey practice. And I remember it felt surreal to be going to field hockey practice, like knowing in the back of your mind, like, what is the point of what I'm doing right now? Oh my God, this is, this is, you know, something profound has happened. And it, um, was, and it wasn't the same thing as it is now where like you had social media, everybody right, was right. glued to TVs. And mm-hmm. that's really yeah. when like the 24 hour news cycle really, really kicked in. It happened yeah. some with Desert Storm, but really this was the, the turning point for the 24 hour news cycle. Mm-hmm. And I, that's what I remember is sitting in the cafeteria at the college that I was at and watching it on the TV and just being like, oh my God, man. And I remember, cause I was a religious institution. A lot of the professors came out and they just started like praying with the students for the country and the people that were mm-hmm. there and the people that were scared. And it was a really comforting thing at that time to have religion. And I don't know what I would have done without it. Like it, like having mm-hmm. that little bit of peace and that to me, that's the reason why religion exists to calm you and those kind of, when you realize things are out of control, at least you have something to put that burden on and then i remember it was like a week after it happened and you kind of are still in the haze of what's going to happen are we going to go to war president bush is making all these statements all these proclamations on national tv sitting behind the resolute desk and looking stoic as fuck and then i remember going to dothan alabama because my my stepdad was in the navy so i had to go to the doctor there and I like twisted my ankle or broke my ankle or something like that. Real, and it was bad. I had to go to the doctor and I went to Dothan, Alabama. And I had gone through base checkpoints my entire life because I'm, I'm a military kid. When they, all the different soldiers at Fort, Fort Rucker, I think is the one there. And whenever they came out, everybody had M4 or M16 cross-bodied and they had legit like Humvees at the gate and they had all kinds of uh, serpentines and shit that were out there. And I remember thinking, Oh my God, man. And they, they came and they made me get out of my vehicle before I could go on base and check underneath it for bombs and like open up my trunk and do all kinds of stuff. And when I was on my way back, I was like, Holy crap, man. Like this is, this doesn't feel like America. Like we felt like it felt so, so different for such a long time that it was, it's really indescribable for people that grow up like my kids or um, Kate's kid. They're never going to be able to understand that much like we were able to understand what it felt like to be a Vietnam veteran, what it felt like to go to Korea and come back without your fingers. And people don't really understand what you did there, what it felt like to actually be in a trench in World War I. You don't understand those things until you live through it. And everybody has that marker that's our age, that it was a, it was a very pivotal point in not only the life of the country, but in our lives and people that were on the ground like nick our producer his dad was a fireman he was supposed to be there that day luckily he wasn't so he wasn't one of ones that was lost we've had people that did lose family members like we mentioned large at the top of the podcast that they're going to go but we also had military members and first responders and the coast guard is one that's kind of overlooked so that's the one that we want to focus in on today because the things that they did when kate goes through it Think about how much praise has gone into the amount of evacuees that were got out of Afghanistan over the course of time when we've had 20 years to prepare for that moment. The Coast Guard had absolutely no time to prepare for this sneak attack and the way that they acted absolutely unequivocally saved thousands of lives. Kate, walk us through the story. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to jump into it a little later in the story because we all, we all know the events of that morning. So this is after the the towers had had gone down as as the tragedy unfolded in front of them from the relative safety of the water civilian captains piloted ferries to the sea walls built along the southern edge of manhattan and began loading them with as many people as possible in places along the shoreline the scared and shocked huddled masses were 10 deep some of these survivors had been enveloped by the post-explosion dust storm and came to the water's edge looking more like ghosts Over shouts from the captains, ship workers, and police on the scene, those flocking to the approaching boats were urged to remain calm and help those that were in need. For the first few hours after the unthinkable had decimated the city, the efforts from the water were spearheaded by New Yorkers simply reacting to what needed to be done. With that, the 9-11 boat lift began. 
all available boats. This is the United States Coast Guard. Those were the words of the U.S. Coast Guard in their initial radio message asking for assistance as they took control of organizing evacuation efforts. That call was sent out to all ships in the vicinity, requesting them to converge on the New York Harbor and Battery Park to begin transporting as many people as they could to safety. As more than 800 mariners scrambled to help, desperation had seized some of those waiting on the shore. People began jumping into the water in panic attempts to swim to the approaching boats. Remarkably, not a single drowning was reported. Some of the first to answer the call were dozens of tugboat crews, normally busy guiding larger vessels through the ports. Under the watchful gaze of the Statue of Liberty, over 150 ferries, tugs, Coast Guard ships, and privately owned recreational boats worked together to shuttle half a million people, 500,000 people, to Staten Island, Ellis Island, and New Jersey. Speaking to CNN on August of 2017. And also think about this at the time, because you have all those different boats approaching. You have no idea where the threat is coming from. Right. Like, because you would never have expected it to come from the sky like that inside the continental United States. All these different boats converging. Now looking at it from like an anti-terrorism perspective, I don't know if they do that same thing now. Like, I don't know if, if they huddle everybody together and say, this is, we're going to be at one point. I don't know if that's something that they do now, but it worked then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, NYPD officer Tyrone Powell had this to say about the extent of the Harbor front rescue efforts put forth by himself and hundreds of others. We had like a Noah's Ark. We had everybody on that boat. We had animals. We had babies without parents. Everyone was covered in soot. And that half a million number is more people than the entire city of St. Louis, in case you're wondering. It's more than the number of allied troops evacuated during Operation Dynamo in the early days of World War II, often referred to as the miracle of Dunkirk. This wartime operation saw civilian and Navy vessels being called into action to help rescue soldiers trapped along the beaches of the French city of Dunkirk as German forces moved around them. That, impression operation, that impressive operation saved the lives of over 330,000 men, but unlike the boat lift on September 11th, it took nine days. The makeshift New York rescue fleet accomplished their feat in just nine hours. Wow. Granted, they weren't being shot at, but they were dealing with whiteout conditions with the massive dust blown their way. Captains of the rescue boats are on record as describing dust clouds so thick that at times even their radar was blocked and rendered use was blocked and rendered useless. They were basically in the water blind, mm -hmm. couldn't see a thing in front of them. Um, boats on the water were also vital in shuttling personnel to ground zero, bringing in supplies for over two years after the attacks. So they helped with cleaning, rebuilding. NYC fire boats were used to pump river water to firefighters battling flames at ground zero and the surrounding buildings. Um, with the New York Harbor challenges of 9-11 itself, we took 500,000 people off the south end of Manhattan to safety. And that was just the Coast Guard and the whole maritime community of the port of New York and New Jersey standing up and recognizing what needed to be done, explained US Coast Guard Admiral James Joy, commandant at the time of the attacks. We grabbed the Staten Island Ferry, the tour boat that goes around the Statue of Liberty and anything that floated. And at the time, we rallied the wherewithal to take half a million people, scared and frightened to death, through the battery and off the southern tip of Manhattan. That's an extraordinary story. Um, and I, I think at this point, you know, Cons and I were talking about Turning Point on Netflix. I, you know, we've probably all seen a million different documentaries at this point about September 11th it puts the whole context for it, including what was happening around the world that led up to it and everything. Um, and one of the things I took from it was they show small stories throughout of the people that just put themselves on the line for other people mm -hmm. throughout the whole thing. Just, I, it's easy to get with everything going on right now with the way things ended in Afghanistan and, you know, the anniversary of September 11th, I, I get very down and very, what's the point of it all. And, you know, evil versus God, I really get in my head about it. Mm -hmm. Stories like this just remind me there, there is so much good in the world. And I believe that absolutely triumphs over all the bad. If you look for these stories, there's so, 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 so many of them. And this is just a small example yeah. of the good on that day. I didn't realize the extent of this story. I didn't yeah. realize it was as big as it was. And I think mm -hmm. it's very interesting. And I'm sure there are some people listening, not understanding why this had to be done, but that's because all the tunnels and bridges were shut down to all, uh, all vehicles. The subways were all shut the subways down. were shut down. All, all air the, travel. The air travel. Everything was shut. So like basically anybody on Manhattan, you could either walk or you could And that get wasn't on just Manhattan. Boats. That was across the country. Yeah. Everything but, was shut down. 
but, but much, specific much to more, this story. Yeah, yeah, much more Manhattan for sure. Right, right. So I mean, the, 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 I knew that all those people got home, uh, you know, that day or, or soon thereafter. I just never gave it thought to this scale that it was this large. And it's very impressive that everybody and not just the Coast Guard, because obviously the Coast Guard doesn't have that many ships on hand in and around Manhattan. So for all these civilians to come to the help of their fellow uh, New Yorkers and folks working in New York was really a, a feat. Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah. Story. I'd never, honestly, I'd never heard that. I mm-hmm. didn't know that was a thing until I, I saw, I was scrolling around and saw that story last night. So um, just, yeah, again, twisted history. Listen to the latest episode of that with large and his wife, Ann. And um, I think Kevin's also uh, maybe Annie as well. I think they're also doing behind the blog w- with Kevin. Yeah. Uh, so that that'll be another perspective as well. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, we're going to move on and have uh, try to end up with a little bit lighter note. And that is going to be brought to you by our friends at Simply Safe. Simply Safe is the best way for home security. If you need a home security system, go with Simply Safe. They have an ultra wide 140 degree field, so you can keep watch over your entire yard. It has 180 degree or 180 HD resolution with eight times zoom, built in spotlight with color night vision, so you can keep an eye on what's going on day and night. And it's easy to remove rechargeable battery so it doesn't need an outlet and go anywhere on the property the camera has all it needs to integrate into your simply safe home security system by extending its own protection to outside together it means every door window and room are protected and your property will be too learn more at simplysafe.com slash zero and order the wireless online security system or outdoor security system simply safe is celebrating this new camera by offering 20 percent off your new system and the first month of monitoring service for free when you roll an interactive monitoring again that's simply safe.com slash zbt we're not allowed technically to use birdie higgins anymore we will get flagged but just imagine birdie higgins is playing and key largo is there and you're taking your stealth back kate you want to sing a couple bars or we could do like, I've got to level a bunch of gook and nuts. There they are. Wrapped around each other, trying so hard to stay warm. That first cold winter together, lying in each other's arms. We had it all. Do, 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 do. Just like Bogey and Bacall. Do, 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 do. Starring in our own late show. Sailing away to Key Largo. Boo, do, 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 do. Here's looking at you, kid. Do, 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 do. Missing all the things we did. Do, 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 all do, right, do. that's quite enough. We're Wait, gonna it's it's a wonder you even needed singing lessons growing up. Like, I don't know. Oh, that was great. So, yeah. There's so Thanks. much natural ability there. Uh, my yeah, wife is going to start taking singing lessons just for fun. Really? I it's love, a hoot. I love later in life hobbies that develop. That's I'm weird. Still, she didn't reach I'm out still to me committed. after that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's weird. weird. <laughs> I'm still committed to learning the piano, and I want the listeners to hold me to that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I wish I knew how to play the piano. I was watching this TikTok the other day and this fella takes like songs and make them sound like Prince and you could take like any song and do it. And he does every single instrument, keyboard, bass, guitar, guitar, violin, drums. He does everything. I, people that talented make me fucking sick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. no need. No Absolutely need for it. Absolutely sick. What also makes me sick is the fact that there is a new Taliban interior minister and he is the son of the founder of the U.S. designated terrorist group and organization. And that's not good, is it? No, well, it's not. Probably here's, not. Here's our Afghanistan updates. Some quick bullet points for you. Uh, the Taliban drew from its inner high echelons to fill top posts in Afghanistan's new government on Tuesday. And this came after scuttlebutt that they were having trouble picking their top kahunas over there. They brought in some people from Pakistan to help them squabble it out. A little bit of bickering amongst Yeah, and they them. said they were going to do it kind of like how the... The Catholics do the the Pope and they're going to have white smoke, but instead it was going to be smoke from. Butt smoke. Butt smoke. World powers are wary after a previous 1996 to 2001 period in power by the Taliban that was marked by bloody vendettas and oppression of women in the most horrific ways possible. Um, The current Ministry of Women's Affairs has already been abolished by the Taliban. And there's photos of. And I don't think in the, they're letting most women go to school, but the Taliban's like, look, we're still letting them in school. We just put a big sheet between the men and the women. I bet so even ridiculous. I bet even that is just for show. Yeah. Um, anyway, Mullah Hassan Akund is the prime minister. And like many in the Taliban leadership, he derives much of his prestige from his close link to the reclusive late founder, Mullah Omar, who we know not a great guy. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Sirahuddin Haqqani, you might remember him from the Haqqani Network. He is the new interior minister. He is the son of the founder, classified as a terrorist group by Washington. He's one of the FBI's most wanted men due to his involvement in suicide attacks and ties with Al Qaeda. Not Mullah, great. Not great. Mullah Mohammed Yakub, son of Mullah Omar, was named as defense minister. Not great. Um, also, Bo Bergdahl, this, this news brought up Bo Bergdahl because four Taliban members swapped for him are now in the Afghan government. I feel, though, that's a little potato potato because Trump also sprung quite a few Taliban goons out of the old pen as well. Yeah, it turns out everybody can do bad things. Everybody (laughs) did bad things there. Yeah, that was was a lot of messing up, but uh, still not great. Still not great. Um, Next bullet point, protests in Kabul and other major cities. A group of Afghan women, and this is just one of the small stories from the day, a group of Afghan women crouched on the side of a Kabul street and took cover after armed members of the Taliban fired into the air to disperse hundreds of protesters. One of them spoke rapidly at the camera filming them. I've seen a lot of photos. Taliban are starting to beat up on journalists, people Mm -hmm. who have cameras and stuff around them. It's like that little grace period is over. They're coming for you. The women who have been protesting in every major city in Afghanistan are braver than anyone in Afghanistan right now, you are hats off to you. My awe knows no bounds for these women. They're going out with their faces uncovered and they're getting right in the Taliban's fucking faces and saying, no, like we're not going back. Remarkable, like remarkable. Like some of these protests that I've seen, there's been women who were ushered into like almost like a basement type thing. And you have like the Taliban members standing there with their guns and they don't give a fuck. They're still screaming at them and doing everything they have to. I mean, (laughs) I cannot imagine I, if I was there and like my mom, wife, sister, whoever, I'd be like, what? Please don't do this. Like, what? Please. Yeah. They're going to kill you. Like, what don't are you gonna do get this. out of this. Yeah. But they, these, they have they feel like they have to. To them, it's worth it. I can't I can't, don't I don't know if I would have that kind of bravery in me. I probably wouldn't. Um, one woman said these people, the Taliban are unjust. They are not human at all. They do not give us the right to demonstrate. They are not Muslims. They are infidels. Heavy gunfire resumed after she gave that quote, leading to more panic. Um, But yeah, a lot of protests happening. A lot of people uh, in the major cities, like when I was in Marjinda, they still full burqa, women had no rights. But in the major cities, women have had a taste now of freedom again for quite some time. And they do not want to go back to the way it was. Um, The same thing that happened in Iran when they had their revolution. And then then when they tried to go back. Like it, like some people are just like, absolutely fucking not. I'm not going back. And they've also reopened the airports there for Kabul International, where they have different flights that are coming in from all across the world. If I was a pilot and I'm flying a commercial airline and you tell me that I'm going to Karzai Airport, I'm telling you to fucking suck my dick from the back. I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> yeah. as heck not. <laughs> They're like, no, like, okay, you're fired. Cool. I will, I'll go to any other airline in the world that doesn't make me go to Kabul. Yeah, no thanks. Um, And speaking of airports, there is one standoff. It's kind of being described as almost a hostage situation. American veteran groups are pleading for action during a week long standoff that has left hundreds of would be evacuees from Afghanistan desperate to board waiting charter flights out of a northern Afghan airport. Um, This one's in Mazari Sharif is where this airport is further up north. Several dozen Americans, along with a much larger number of U.S. green card holders and their family members, are waiting to board pre-arranged charter flights, many paid for and sponsored by different veterans groups here in the U.S. who are trying Mm -hmm. to get them out. Um, They're going nowhere. They're at a standstill. The Taliban is not letting them leave. They have spent, I was reading one woman is like, I've been on this airport floor for eight days now. They're not letting us go anywhere, do anything. It's like a hostage situation. Um, So closely monitoring that in the news. Um, Up next, conflicting reports out of Panjir Valley. Uh, The fighting continues, according to a member of the National Resistance, a.k.a. the NRF. Um, Again, that's the multi-ethnic group of tribes, militias, Afghan military personnel who all went to that one mountainous area and was like, fuck the Taliban, we're holding on till the very end. Um, Obviously, uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud's son is leading the resistance there and they're holding on. The Taliban's like, we won, we got them out of there. And they're like, no, you haven't. That's just not so fast. So, yeah. And then finally, Chaps, I'll cover this last little nugget here. Um, 20 years after September 11th, this had totally fallen off my radar. Like, yeah, completely. completely. So Khalid, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is awaiting trial. And this is something that I've been getting updates for, um, for like press and everything. For I, had years. To look up, I had to look up who he was again. Exactly. Oh, yeah. 
the principal architect of the 9-11 attacks. He was one of the first ones that was captured and then one of the main folks that was sent to Guantanamo Bay for essentially torture, like the Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, enhanced interrogation techniques and shit like that. The CIA black ops like definitely went after this guy whenever they first captured him. And he's been in Guantanamo Bay for essentially the last 20 years. Even since I've been doing ZBT and like got in with like media, the Pentagon and shit like that, they've been trying to have these trials over and over and over again. There was one point where it was going to happen in Cuba. I think it was like three years ago. I don't think you're on the show yet, Kate. I think I or Kate wasn't on the show yet. Cons, I think I told you I might go to Cuba to actually like cover this trial. Mm-hmm. Well, it's going to be happening soon, which It's kind of scary, you know, like when you have one of these masterminds that are on trial, same thing with the shoe bomber. And anytime that one of those main folks is on trial, same thing really with um, El Chapo, like from Mexico. When you have one of those main guys that are on trial, you never know what's going to happen. And it's really, really scary. There's even points where I've been involved and had to do like security for high level federal murder trials where people are going to get busted out for like a gang pin. I had to do that at Quantico one time. And you like standing there, you're like, it feels different. You know, like when you're in a spot where you're not sure, like I I equate those same feelings to like, if I was actually on a, a bomb threat that was legit and you thought there legitimately might be a bomb here that makes your butthole pucker IED sweeps, make your butthole pucker standing outside a courtroom and that kind of stuff going on. This is going to be a security nightmare right Mm -hmm. after September 11th. Yeah. And I mean, it's insane that it even took this long, this article. Well, it's not that insane when you consider how our justice system works and especially 20 the, years. It's crazy. Basically, the well, lawyers it's insane, saying, insane, but that's just the way it works. The lawyer is saying the system was set up for failure. Um, 15 years ago, Monday, President George W. Bush ar- announced the arrival of Al Qaeda detainees at Guantanamo prison, joining hundreds of other prisoners already held in this U.S. enclave. The reasons the wheels of justice are moving so slowly are many. Logistical nightmare to travel there. Um, The military commission system set up for this trial was created from scratch in the Obama administration. So every rule can be a point of contention. It's like, you guys made this up. That doesn't count. This doesn't count. That doesn't count. After hours of litigation, um, frequent turnover of lawyers and judges because this has simply taken so long. But the biggest factor of why it's taking so long, and this I wouldn't have considered this, is secrecy. It took years for defense lawyers to get summaries of classified evidence against their clients, even though they have top secret security clearances. So, you know, when you see those documents that are redacted and all the blacked out stuff and blah, 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 they've just been fighting to get that stuff, that information, and they haven't been able to. It's bureaucracy. It's red tape. It's insanity. Um, And And then there had to be fights in the federal court system about whether they had the right to habeas corpus or not, if they had the if they had the same rights as a U.S. citizen, which I would contend that they do not. But they also they also would have to go to that like people along the way say, why don't they go to The Hague and deal with Geneva and those because they're not combatants. They don't fall under that either. Like The Hague only deals with combatants. They can't go to The Hague because they're technically not there and they don't have the right to habeas corpus because they're not Americans. And you Mm -hmm. brought them here. This is crazy, too. Inside the courtroom, journalists and family members are they watch behind this wall of thick glass and the sound is piped in on a 40 second delay in case one of the defendants blurts out something classified. So it's like how the radio, there's a seven second delay in case you say a cuss word. Mm -hmm. It's like that, but 40 seconds. So they're watching and they don't hear what the people are saying. You know how annoying it is to watch TV when the sound is slightly off. It's like that, but with a 40 (laughs) second delay. Um, And how are you going to have a fucking jury? Like this, like this dude's been in the news. You see this guy. I'm like guilty. guilty. <laughs> don't even, I don't need I don't, opening don't statement. Opening statement. Guilty. Can we can we vote? Can we, can we get out of that? here? I don't even need to stay to lunch. I don't need yeah. to stay yeah. guilty. Um, a Duke law professor who heads the Guantanamo Defense Clinic um, said there's a possibility of having no trial at all. So what we've been doing to have, in essence, no trial at all. It's not necessarily a foregone conclusion that there will even be a trial. And so I've heard that as well. Years, I've, even, I've heard that as well, that this is the another way, like the delaying is just kicking it down the can because they know realistically, like they brought him here. He was never here. You don't have jurisdiction. Like jurisdiction is huge in cases. And mm-hmm. we might not have jurisdiction in this case, but as, as long as you keep him and you keep kicking that can down the road, eventually he's going to die and be like, oh, because- well. Imagine being the president or the one who who 
is in charge when this guy goes loose, when this guy's set free because they can't do anything. Oh, it's I don't know that he'll ever be set no, free. He definitely, won't ever, he definitely won't ever go free. But I, no. I, But if he, you do have a trial and it comes back somehow innocent, I mean. That's what I'm saying. It's They can't even risk it. Like, they can't. Like that's, can't why, no. that's why the can's going to keep getting kicked down the road. Like, and not why. just because the American but, response of you let this motherfucker go because he's guilty in the conscience of all Americans. And then if he does get released, the victory that is for Al Qaeda and like all those different ISIS and everybody will be celebrating that shit mm-hmm. that yeah, they got but, away with it. You know what? Ask yourself this because you're talking about, you know, the Hague and everything. If if if, if he didn't get really a very fair trial and, and things didn't go too well for old Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's going to hold our feet to the fire? Anybody in the world, uh, aside from, you know, his family and, and his organization, who in their right mind across the world is going to say, oh, America, you shouldn't have done that. Well, to that, I, mean, I would say they can all kick rocks because this guy deserves to die. And not only that, but there's been precedents that you do target drone strikes for this one person. We even did it to an American citizen that was living in Yemen that was mm-hmm. having all types of Al Qaeda statements and shit like that. We just went in there complete violation of his rights because he actually is an American. They said that he is an enemy combatant. Boom, killed him in Yemen with an airstrike. I wrote a college paper on that and I wasn't sure how I felt about it because I do feel strongly that all Americans have the right to a fair trial. But at certain points, do you denounce your American citizenship? Like, can you lose that? The the law answer is no. Like, you can't lose your American citizenship. Mm-hmm. But. You're I think you could do some you're things. Not kinda, oh, you're, you can do some terrorist things. Oh, it's tough. Maybe, maybe it's you're not tough. so much an American. Like, it's anymore. hard. It's really hard to get up in arms about. That's why folks that do shit, like some of these lawyers that work for uh, the ACLU, some of the scumbags that they will represent just because of the quote slippery slope that can be that can happen from that, which I understand that logic too. That would be so so difficult because mm-hmm. you value the law so much that even the worst of these you want to defend to the end of the law. Like that to me is like, oh my god, I don't know if I could do that shit. Mm-mm. Yeah, Mm-mm. Um, that's. I actually asked uh, a friend of mine. He's a very uh, prominent attorney in New Jersey, and he used to represent a lot of uh, folks from organized crime families. And I said to him one time, because I was just curious, I said, how is it that you can defend those people, you know, even if you have the inkling that they might be guilty of what they're charged from? And he said very, very succinctly, everybody has a right to a fair trial. So my job is not whether or not to prove their innocence. It is to ensure that their constitutional rights are upheld. Yeah, so, and you swear to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign, domestic. Then there's not a there's not a caveat unless you're a bad person. Like you do yeah. it for everybody. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Let's move on to a little bit of save rounds and alibis, which today is going to be brought to you by our friends at Roman. If you're thinking about coming because you've been coming so early lately, you've just been fucking hitting them ropes early. Maybe mm-hmm. try a Roman swipe. They are clinically proven way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and fast acting. They don't require a prescription. Roman can send you swipes in a discreet, unmarked package, and each one of those packets is small enough to hide in your little wallet or wherever you might need it, in a pocketbook, in a satchel, wherever you got. They're super easy to use. Just take them things out, swipe it on that dick of yours, and let it dry, and you're good to go. That's it. Go to GetRoman.com slash zero for your first month of swipe for just five bucks when you choose a monthly plan that's get roman.com slash zero let's move into save rounds and alibis Catherine, we'll start with you huge shout out to the team usa military athletes who were thriving during the 2021 tokyo paralympics there were 19 military affiliated athletes 16 veterans three active duty soldiers who brought home eight medals team usa ended fourth overall with 37 gold 36 silver and 31 bronze i feel like um I'm guilty of it. Didn't give it as much attention as it deserves watching the clips and seeing what to me, it's even more impressive than the Olympics. Oh, you know, some of these over. things that the folks were doing. I watched some of the, there's this one. Did you see that one fella like in the um, volleyball where you have to be on the ground and you, this dude's like seven foot nine and he's uh, he has to sit on the ground and he was just like dominant for a ring, yeah. like just, yeah. just putting his hands up and doing this. And then I saw one, where I didn't know this because they have like for the unsighted, for the blind folks out there, they have long jump competitions and things mm-hmm. like that. They you have to wear a blindfold just so you have no advantage whatsoever. Right. And, the, and the way that they can navigate is sound like that. They're yeah. going through and listening to sound. 
Well, because of something happened, one of the fellows got off track and mm-hmm. jumped, did a long jump and landed like right on his tailbone on the mm-hmm. fucking concrete, oh. jumping as far as he could. I was like, it's one of those moments where you see somebody get hurt and you feel it too. Like yeah. I, I was looking at him, I was like, oh my God, man. Like how bad that would hurt. You got to mm. put more pads out like that. Yeah. You would think. You can't see. You need pads. Safety is paramount. Putting yourself out there to do that. I mean, it, it takes so much bravery and it's so impressive to me. So congrats to all those athletes who just absolutely crushed it out there. The skill to have a wheelchair and doing handball and like yeah. mm-hmm. moving all around and doing all that stuff with just two hands like crazy. Yeah, crazy. Super impressive. Other than that, I don't think I have anything. Yeah, I guess that's it for me. Just Again, thinking of everyone this weekend, I know it's just a really strange time. Don't be afraid to reach out for help. Don't be afraid to keep reaching out to your military buddies, to your civilian, whoever. Um, just say hello. Just, I don't know, but just send in love to everyone. That's all. There you go, cons. Cool. Uh, a shout out and, and a thank you to uh, Mike Rabel, one of the co-founders of the PLL. He hosted me at the, the semis down in Philly this past weekend. I had a lot of fun there. I went into, I don't think I'd ever been or at least not in recent memory, I'd never been into a Wegmans. What a delightful mm-hmm. establishment that was. Someone showed Very up. nice. I went to use the restroom. I, I thought I was like in a hotel or something. That's how nice the restroom was. So shout out to Wegmans. Maybe, mm. maybe you'd like to come onto the pod and, and, and sponsor us because I sure do like you. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, this, this weekend, I'm back up at West Point. I have my 15-year uh, reunion. Very excited about that. We have a lot of events planned. Uh, first home game where fans are back in the stadium. So happy to see that. Uh, just overall, very excited uh, for the weekend. And, uh, you know, anybody listening uh, who was affected uh, by the events of, of 9-11, just know that we are thinking of you. And if, if you have anyone in your life that was affected, uh, I'm sure it'd be nice if you reach out to those folks uh, and just keep them in your thoughts uh, this weekend as it is a very tough time. And I think it'll be especially tough this year on son, such a monumentous uh, anniversary. Yep. I, I think that um, the military community is one that really values tradition and we value things that have gone on before and you pay homage to those things. One of the things that I actually like about President Trump post-presidency, he does not give a fuck about post-presidency decorum. And <laughs> it's so, because usually like Obama, whenever our Bush, whenever Obama, our Obama, whenever Bush left office, he didn't talk shit about him. Really, Biden is talking shit about Trump. Trump talks shit about Obama. So that's broken now. Like people just will do that. And the old president will talk shit about the new president. That being said, presidents, by and large, stay out of the limelight for big news. President Trump on September 11th will be hosting and doing the announcing on a boxing, a pay-per-view boxing match with his son. To do it yeah he's getting paid to host a boxing match it's on so weird. A, tr- a thriller event uh, and so, whether yeah. you like him or not the clips that are going to come from that are going to be absolute gold it's twitter, brilliant twitter it's brilliant. is going to be so much fun on saturday night lot on saturday <laughs> night just because mm-hmm. that's going down i don't know i don't know if those two are the only ones on the mic if it's going to be like them being like that version of big cat and dave or how it's going to go down either way I'm not going to pay for the fight. Let's not get fucking insane, but I am going to pay very close attention to those clips. And I think that you all should as well, because after a day of coverage and thinking about uh, tragedy, everybody needs a little bit of ridiculous in the night and (laughs) a little ridiculousness at the end of the night and three Chi with president Trump calling a boxing match. I think exactly will be that Um, we'll look forward to talking to you about that. When we come back next week, sound the retreat. 